there's two ways that you can approach scar therapy. Uh, one way is uh, the ultimate goal, obviously, with scar therapy, in my opinion, is to make the scar more supple, so that way it causes less disruption in the system. Do you do um, scar therapy? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like kind of the basics there? I'm not really too familiar with those. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, there's two ways that you can approach scar therapy. Uh, one way is uh, the ultimate goal, obviously, with scar therapy, in my opinion, is to make the scar more supple, so that way it causes less disruption in the system. Okay, what I mean by that is when you so if you have, <clears throat> for example, if you have scar tissue on the inside of your knee, there's two things that that scar tissue can do. One is it can trap nerves or nerve endings in it that can cause a cycle of neurogenic inflammation. That obviously. If you've got a whole bunch of dumping of substance P, CGRP, uh, those neuropeptides, then you're gonna have pain over that scar, mm -hmm. okay? That's one aspect. The other aspect is if that scar tissue is sufficient and it is in the right orientation um, and it has the right texture to it, what it can do is it can actually stop fascial movement. And so you could end up having a tethering of fascia down here that ends up resulting in less fascial movement at the hip, which could end up resulting in altered mechanics at the hip, which could then lead to a functional impingement, which could then lead to hip pain. And so even though the scar is not painful, it can result in a change in how the myofascial system transmits forces and energy throughout the body and can result in uh, pain elsewhere. Um, now the approach for um, both of those can be the same. It's I generally don't uh, really alter how I treat the scar, whether it's we're actually dealing with local pain versus a uh, an alteration in the mechanics because of the scar. Mm -hmm. Um, so from an injection standpoint, because there's obviously like obviously castor oil I use quite a bit with patients because that helps with scar tissue a lot, mm -hmm. using a heating pad over it. Um, you can do actually, you can just take like a quarter um, or even a spoon, kind of like a little, like a gua sha type approach. Mm -hmm. And you can do that to help kind of free up some of the, um, the bands inside of it. Um, but from an injection standpoint, uh, there's two main groups of solutions you can use. One is your traditional scar therapy solution, which is going to be, um, it's usually just like a lidocaine, marcaine um, uh, solution that's going to numb up quickly and also decrease the pain, but that more so allows you to go in and mechanically fenestrate the scar to actually try to break it up from the inside, okay? And so you <clears throat> basically how we do that is we thread the needle into the scar and then we retrograde inject the anesthetic which then will obviously numb that up and then you basically go back through the scar until it feels kind of like you're going through butter so you're really actually trying to break up some of that scar tissue um, the other solution is in our our ortho biologic realm so that's our you can use uh, PRP, you can use platelet pore plasma, but I prefer PRP, um, and you can use uh, you can use different products if you want to, or the autologous stem cells. So generally, I would prefer adipose over bone marrow. Mm -hmm. But the goal with that is is still the same. I still do a mechanical fenestration with it. Generally, it's less aggressive than if they're fully numb, just mm -hmm. because it's really really painful, and. Um, when we're doing the anesthetic version, we're relying solely because the actual anesthetic is not having any healing properties for the scar tissue. Um, whereas if we use PRP, there's antifibrotic growth factors that are released from PRP that are going to help. And so we don't have to be as aggressive on the scar tissue. Um, but we're still going through injecting, fenestrating, injecting more, um, and again, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is make that scar more supple. It may not, the appearance may not change because that has to do, the appearance of it more has to do with the, the epidermis and dermis. But from the inside, we can create better 
fascial sliding uh, tissues and less entrapment of nerves, which can help with that local or that indirect type of pain. Would you do it, uh, let's say someone was like a keloid former, would that <clears throat> change your approach at all? If it was causing like an adhesion? Um, yeah, sometimes I'll put, I've only had a few patients that I've uh, decided to do this with on keloids, generally keloids, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I add a little bit of uh, dexamethasone in mm -hmm. with the PRP. So a little bit of steroid mm -hmm. with the PRP. And those patients, the reason I decided to do that was walking through their minor surgery history and things like that is when there was dexamethasone on board with whatever they were doing, they, they either didn't keloid or they keloided a lot less than normal. And so for me, that was an uh, indication that I could go ahead and not just make a massive keloid in the process. Yeah. Along those lines, if you were treating a keloid, I imagine you'd be going into the, injecting into the body of the keloid itself, or would you still go below it? Like so? Oh, I'd want to go above, below, within, around. Yeah, I really want to bathe the whole, the whole area. And that's the fenestration process. Yeah. And it's, would it, it, I imagine it'd be like a retrograde kind of inject, injection, so you go in and as you're withdrawing. Generally I do, just because it's a little bit easier because you've made a, you know, a 25 gauge hole that at least allows some fluid out. Because especially when you're in a really, really dense scar, it's going to be really, really difficult to, and sometimes uh, I've had to with the, when, and this was more so when I'm doing the anesthetic version, <clears throat> is I'd have to kind of uh, almost do like a field block around the scar first because mm -hmm. I would try to, I would go in and I just could not push fluid into the scar. It was so, so dense. And so I would come out and kind of almost do like a field block. Mm -hmm. So that way I could go in and at least do some fenestration to make some holes and some paths that wasn't as painful as it would have been if I did do the field block. And then I can inject the fluid and then that can start to just, because remember the fluid as well is going to help open up fascial planes and, and spaces between tissues. Yeah. Could you use an adipose for that? Yeah. You kind of stay there in place and... Yep. <clears throat> I like what? using adipose for scars when I have the ability. What about using the chondrolytic and fibrolytic effects of low steroids? Um, I haven't ever really, um, gone down that path yeah. and is there, have you seen much research on it? I've seen a few case studies, but it's more for, um, like fibrotic contractures, like heavy things and stuff oh. like that. Unless for scar, but I'm <clears> thinking, <throat> why wouldn't it be the same? Right. Um, I think my personal hesitation with that has just always been, um, what am I doing to the tissues around it mm -hmm. in trying to <clears throat> get that particular area of the scar to be more supple. I think that's just been always my personal hesitation with adding in outside of the times that I've used it for patients who keloid. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that's such a low dose that I'm using. Um, but I think that's probably why I haven't really explored it much, just because of that hesitation. Yeah. And I think I would think that if you did a head-to-head -head comparison of PRP versus uh, a low-dose steroid, that your probably your six and your twelve-month outcomes are going to be better with PRP compared to steroid. Is this something you'd have to do multiple times <clears throat> in succession, short period of time, or would you do them spaced out? Um, I do them spaced out, and I take a very similar approach as I do with my joint injections. And so <clears throat> we track how the patient's doing, how the scar feels, because they'll start, I actually just had a, a scar tissue injection probably about two weeks ago now, and the girl has already started to notice changes in the appearance and the feel of the scars. And so we'll just keep tracking to see how that does and correlate that with her pain until she hits a plateau. And because if she hits a plateau and she's 95% better, then <clears throat> I don't see the need to do anything else. But if she plateaus at 50%, then we can go in and, and intervene. So I, I generally don't, uh, 
uh, have a protocol for like, okay, we're gonna do one a week for three weeks or mm -hmm. anything like that. I like letting the body figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat>